Hello and welcome to episode 446 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I, I'm good and I'm very, very warm. I mean, we were laughing before we started and I've somehow ended up wearing three pairs of trousers while doing this podcast. Very long story short, so, I was so cold this morning and walking into the office where it's freezing cold because of the way the office is and I ended up putting thermals on. I thought I'd wear them under my trousers or tracksuit bottoms and then I realised I was going to be filming today and I had to look a bit smarter and then it wasn't until later in the office when I was I went to the toilet I realized that I hadn't actually changed back out the tracksuit bombs in the end I've got thermal tracksuit bottoms and a pair of trousers on so I'm overheating and feeling quite restricted as I do the podcast and you are overheating as well let's not forget because you are wearing heated socks I'm wearing my Christmas present for my children with a well it's heated socks so they've got batteries in them but the battery packs are quite significant in size so I look like I'm on day release and I've got those on they keep my toes at 70 degrees and I've got terrible circulation so I am particularly hot and warm. Andy, you're probably freezing because we have to turn the heating off in the studio while we do this. Otherwise, you get a very annoying buzz. Yeah, on that then, and I am getting colder as we're doing the podcast. Let's move on to what we've got coming up on this week's show. So this week, I'm doing three pieces or we're doing three pieces as usual one of them being investing so i want to talk about etf so exchange traded funds in particular there's a nuance that's come to light and one of the cons one of the drawbacks potentially with etfs or a certain type of etf that i want people to be aware of where they could potentially lose money now the second piece i want to do is talking about the fire movement not the fire movement that we've talked about in the past that's the financial independence retire early movement it's a sibling of sort to the traditional fire movement one that probably more people will have an affinity or probably prefer that is slightly less restrictive than the traditional fire movement and the third piece on the pod this week andy is harvey's going to be coming onto the show that's right we're going to be talking about funeral expenses there's been some research that has said funeral expenses are on the rise and so we looked at a few ways that people could plan for their funeral essentially and rising cost of funerals so we'll be looking at different types of funeral expense cover but also prepayment funeral plans which are slightly different to the insurance that you can buy yeah and uh, it's definitely worth listening to because a lot of this was news to me we were looking into it and the types of policies and the nuances are quite interesting and particularly you may have people who are elderly in your family who may be paying into some of these plans so it's good to understand what they are and some of the drawbacks as well before we start the first piece i just want to mention don't forget there's going to be a quiz tomorrow so on instagram it's become a very popular thing we've started where we do five multiple choice questions based upon the content on the show from the day before so this week's show you'll find five multiple choice questions as of monday you can go and try and answer them and i set the questions and funny enough last week nobody got five out of five so come on i know you can do better i'd like to see somebody get five out of five who knows if you do you may get a money to the masses mug so cracking straight on with the first piece andy etfs and the issue that's come to light with a particular type. Now, if you don't know what an exchange traded fund is, I'm going to put a link in the notes of the podcast so you can go through and watch a video that I produce on the YouTube channel that explains the different types of funds that exist, the difference between unit trusts, investment trusts, and exchange traded funds, ETFs. Now, if you are an investor, there are lots of different ways you can invest in assets. You can hold things directly, but for most people, they will end up investing, let's say, in their pension. It could be in their ISA, buying funds. So you unit trust investment trust and exchange traded funds and they allow you to have a portfolio of assets that will be diversified and even within those funds because they're run by managers that hold lots of different companies for example if we're talking about an equity fund that gives diversification within that fund they could hold 50 100 different companies and then you have multiple funds within your portfolio it makes for a diversified mix now what i want to focus on today is exchange traded funds now there are three types of etfs you've got the synthetic etfs you have fully replicated and what i will call physical etfs and then you have sampled etfs which are again a version of a physical etf so I want to go through, explain what they quickly are and then give you the pros and cons because it's relevant in order to understand what we're going to be talking about in a second about synthetic ETFs in particular. Now, 
If we talk about the fully replicated ETFs, first of all, or physical ETFs, because it's just quicker for me to say, let's say they are tracking a FTSE 100 index. So it's fully replicated physical ETF. What they will do is they will buy the underlying shares in the FTSE 100 in the same proportion. So they're buying the shares, they hold them, and therefore the performance you get by investing in that ETF will replicate that of the FTSE 100. There will be some tracking errors, so it'll be a marginal difference, and also there's an associated cost with buying all those things. So you won't be exactly what the FTSE 100 does when you look at the news, but it'll be very, very close. Another alternative is a sampled ETF. So you could invest in a ETF that tracks a FTSE 100, but uses a sampled method, so a sampling method. And what that will do is that will invest in a portion of those companies. So therefore the performance will largely reflect that of the FTSE 100, but they won't necessarily invest in every single company. The final type is synthetic. And what a synthetic ETF does is you swap contracts to replicate the index performance without holding the actual assets. And so that introduces something called counterparty risk because the contracts that I mentioned will be with a third party. So that counterparty risk is that the counterparty, the third party, won't be able to uphold their part of the bargain, which is to effectively give you the FTSE 100's replicated performance. So that is a risk that's associated with those synthetic type of ETFs. That's not what I'm talking about today, because we talked about that in the past, but this is something that's come to light because of a particular issue with an index when it starts to change its makeup. But before I get on to that, let me just give you the pros and cons of each of those types so people understand them. So the pros of a physical or fully replicated ETF is that they have the ownership of the underlying assets, they have more control and there's more security. So they actually do hold the asset and they have the ability to sell that asset if need be. Now, the con of that you can obviously imagine there's high costs because it's obviously the cost of having to buy and sell the underlying assets and there's also a potential liquidity issue because if one of those underlying assets can't be sold for some reason then that's going to be an issue with them trying to therefore replicate the index going forward and it's less flexible and more expensive now you have got the sampled type of etf now one of the pros of that is there is a cost efficiency compared to a fully replicated etf but they still hold the actual assets themselves so the lower transaction cost is a pro when compared to that fully replicated version and of course one of the downsides is that there is going to be a larger tracking area when compared to that fully replicated physical etf because you don't hold all of the stocks in the etf so the etf if it's doing the FTSE 100 if it doesn't hold all 100 companies in the same proportion then of course there is going to be a tracking error of sort. So it's very dependent on the manager's ability to select a representative sample. So with the sampling then, can that work both for and against you, depending on market moves? Yeah, so actually there's a good point that you, you raise that. So because something is sampled, let's imagine you've got an index and the sampling method means that a particular company isn't in that ETF's sampling of that index. Let's say there was something very specific to that company that made their share price collapse. Then and if that ETF sampling doesn't include that particular company, then obviously the performance will reflect that. So it won't have the dip or the negative part or negative influence that would come from that collapse in that particular company share price. So that would work for you in that example. If again, in that same example, that ETF didn't include that particular company and that company share price went through the roof, then you wouldn't benefit from it. So it can work for and against you. So it's a good question because that again relates to something that I'm going to come on to. So the pros of a synthetic ETF, you get a very efficient tracking because of the swap contracts. So if you're trying to track a particular market, for example, there is maybe high hard to access but there is that counterparty risk because there is a third party that's effectively giving you that performance so they've got to hold up their side of the bargain and the other con with them is obviously there's a structural issue that I'm going to come on to so why have I brought this to the podcast now if we go back to the end of last year there was something that happened the S&P Dow Jones removed Nigeria from the select frontier index that it runs and it had its reasons and its reasons were because of significant delays in capital repatriation which effectively means that it wasn't efficient to be able to buy and sell stocks in Nigeria and actually get the funds back and to be able to reinvest that so it was removed from the index now that started to cause a problem because you've got to think in a world where you are running a synthetic ETF as a manager, what happened? The Nigerian stocks made up 4.8% 
of the ETF. So you've suddenly found that 4.8% of the ETF that you run has effectively been written to zero if you had a synthetic ETF. And so that means that for an investor using that particular type of ETF, that would have hit performance. If, on the other hand, the ETF was a physical replicated ETF, so fully replicated, and the Nigerian stocks were therefore held, if they were going to track that index, that manager would have to sell down those stocks that it held in those Nigerian companies. They still have them, just because the index doesn't have them anymore. They have now got to try and rejig the portfolio to replicate that index, but they still have those stocks. They would then sell them and they would have the funds that they could get and they would then for be able to reinvest that money into the rest of the fund and replicate the index going forward. So in that instance, physical ETFs had an advantage over the synthetic ones rather than just having that portion that was reflecting the performance of the Nigerian stock market effectively being written to zero. So suddenly people were like, well, this is an issue that we probably weren't aware of or one of the drawbacks of synthetic ETFs. So the message would therefore seem to be always hold physical ETFs. And that is really one of the rules of thumb that I would go by because if I invest where I do invest via an ETF in my 80-20 portfolio, I'd use a physical version of investing in gold for reasons of, well, firstly, the main reason I do it is you don't have the counterparty risk. But this is obviously a risk that has come to light that most people wouldn't have thought of and even I wouldn't have thought of. Now, does that mean holding a physical ETF protects you completely? No, because although this is a very rare occurrence, so let's say in the last 25 years, it's probably only really happened once. There was another occurrence, in fact, that happened two years ago, and that was when Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, if you go back and remember what happened if you invested during that time, then there were sanctions that were imposed, and it meant that the investments that people held in stocks in Russia collapsed in price because they became effectively frozen and people weren't able to trade in those stocks. So if you were investing in a fund and you look back and looked at the performance of some of the, there was a Fidelity Emerging Markets, the EMEA fund that they had, had exposure to Russia. The performance of that fell through the floor during that period because the value of the Russian stocks were effectively reduced because people couldn't trade them and it started to have an impact on performance. Now, what happened, there were some indices back then in a similar fashion that changed and removed Russian exposure from them. And what that meant is, that again, the synthetic ETFs had that issue where there were a portion of the portfolio or the performance would have effectively been written down to zero. So there was a potential loss being taken on that part when the synthetic ETFs were replicating the new index. But those who were physically replicating the index that had changed to remove the Russian exposure would have had Russian stocks. And the issue was they couldn't actually do anything with them. So they were having to hold on to those, which would impact performance and therefore cause issues in terms of tracking the performance of the index that they were trying to do going forward. So the physical ETFs weren't protected from this chain. So it gives you an example. This was a geopolitical incident. The Nigerian one was something that was actually a decision that was made because of liquidity. Russia invading Ukraine, it caused a geopolitical event that therefore caused indices to change and even physical ETFs were impacted. Yes, you could argue that in time they would have been able to sell the shares they held in the Russian companies, but it does just show that you're not protected completely, even if it's a, a physical ETF. So why do I mention this on the podcast this time around? Well, the reason is because we're in a world now where there are more geopolitical issues that are occurring. And obviously you've got the issue in Ukraine, other parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East. So is there an argument, therefore, there could be more catalysts for change in these indices, maybe some of these obscure indices that are tracking maybe emerging markets, frontier markets that people will probably only access via ETFs and probably most likely access via synthetic ETFs because one of the big advantages of synthetic ETFs is they do allow you to access markets that probably are less accessible and are potentially less liquid. Now, if that's the case and people are investing in them, they need to be aware that there is this potential going forward for changes that may end up impacting performance because there could be losses that are taken when these indices are changed and that people are investing in them via synthetic ETFs. 
Oddly, going back to your question that you had about the sample ETFs, you could have a case, and you'd probably be quite lucky, where the sampling meant that you didn't have exposure to a particular country. Maybe it would be companies that fell foul of a particular chain, so they were removed. And you might be lucky that you didn't have exposure to that particular area, and the change in index therefore didn't impact the ETF that you were in. You'd have to be quite lucky, but it does theoretically mean at least that people People could be more informed if they were trying to invest in particular areas to look at the index. What exposure does the index that it's tracking, the ETF that you're investing in, what index does it track? What are the potential risks? I mean, it's very subjective, but then you could think, well, do I want to invest via a physical, fully replicated ETF, a, a physical sampled ETF, or a synthetic one? And then at least you know what the risks are and you can make the choices yourself. I imagine there's investors out there that this is news to them and perhaps they want to now look into their portfolio and have have a little look and see what they've got or perhaps they want to invest going forward and choose one of these options so is there an easy way for them to be able to spot the type of etf that they're going into so i mean 80 20 investor members we we do explicitly state whether things are physical fully replicated synthetic or sampled you should find it via your platform if you're investing or via the fact sheet relating to that particular etf so yes you can find that information but as i've just explained nothing is perfect you aren't going to be able to mitigate all of the risks the real thing is you need to be aware of the risk whether it's counterparty risk or whether it's the uh, risks that come with even physical etfs that i mentioned earlier so as long as you're aware of the risks then you won't be surprised going forward if something happens Okay, so let's move on to the next piece of the podcast then. We're going to bring Harvey back onto the show. We're talking about funeral costs, something we haven't really covered on the podcast before. What have we got? Yeah, so Andy, normally I speak about things like life insurance when I come on the podcast. And one of the elements of life insurance is that people look to cover the cost of a funeral. Now, a report came out recently from Sun Life, the insurance company, which covers the cost of dying. And it showed us that the costs of funerals are going up. And today what we want to do is explore that a little bit further. So when we're talking about funeral and funeral costs, they're often the costs that are associated with the actual funeral plan itself. But of course, the cost of dying is often much more. Can you explain a bit more about that? Yes. So what the report does is it highlights the cost of funerals. And most of us understand that as the basic cost of a coffin, funeral director, the services, um, limousines, cars, flowers, all those sorts of things that we pay for when we arrange a funeral. If you have done, then you'll know what's involved. But the cost of dying is really all the peripheral costs as well. So your estate usually goes through a process called probate and to achieve a grant of probate, there are fees that are involved with that. And there may be additional costs that come with settling somebody's estate after they pass away. And if you incorporate all of those costs, then we come to the eventual cost of dying, which is now, as per Sun Life's report, the highest that it has been for the 20 years that they've been compiling this report. And it now stands at just shy of £10,000. It's £9,658 overall. Okay, so the report highlighted that there's been a couple of years where costs have fallen through the pandemic years, but then costs have since risen. Explain a bit more about why that happened and where we're at now. So costs have dropped over the last two years. So when you look at the figures that Sun Life put out in 2021 and 2022, you will notice that they're lower and actually fell from the year 2020. Now, that's largely because the market for direct cremations grew. So where there was a necessity for some situations to call for a direct cremation during the pandemic years, others actually switched on to the fact that this was a possibility and actually would prefer a simpler send off that cost their families less money and therefore the direct cremation market has grown and that has pushed the overall cost down for the last couple of years. When you add into that direct burials which became available and started being measured by the report over the last year or so that again has allowed for the cost to drop somewhat but the cost of living 
has affected most service providers' costs, overall costs, running costs, and that has now taken that cost of a funeral up again marginally. It's gone up by about 4.7%. Okay, so costs fell largely because there was kind of a different market almost that opened up because of the direct cremation and direct burial services. Briefly explain what they are and how they differ, because this might be the first time people have heard of these such services. How do they work? Essentially, a funeral requires lots of different steps. And unless you've been in the unfortunate situation where you've had to arrange a funeral for a loved person, then you will find yourself alien to some of the service charges that are involved. Now, direct cremation strips away some of those costs. So there are costs associated with the actual mourners attending a service. Um, If there are no mourners, a direct cremation can be conducted with no mourners or a limited number of mourners as part of the service. That limits the cost of the service itself. Generally, direct commissions are marketed as a means to a person's body being recovered and taken away to be cremated and then for the ashes to be returned to the family. And that is the simplest way that that kind of service can be carried out and it reduces the costs massively. So where you might be looking at an average cost of round about £4,000 for a funeral, a direct cremation might be about half of that. Okay, so we've talked about the numbers there, how they've gone down and now they're back on the rise because of rising costs. We've talked about the difference between direct services and more traditional funeral services. So people thinking about this now, they haven't got sort of plans in place for what's going to happen to them should they die what are the things people can do there's obviously maybe insurance policies maybe they've got the money what, what do they do with that how do they save it up there's a load of options i'm taking it absolutely i mean it's natural for most of us to start thinking about things like death and funerals as we get closer to the end of our lives but that doesn't mean to say that you know death may come to some of us prematurely and that's a reality that when you look at these figures may be difficult for your family to deal with if they find themselves in those circumstances. So some of the numbers might highlight to some people the need to make provisions for those funeral costs, especially at around £4,000. There are going to be many families that don't have that kind of money. And it adds to the bereavement, it adds to the grief, and actually people in a grieving state don't really want to be thinking about where the money comes from. So if you're planning ahead and you want to make provisions for the cost of your funeral, there are a few things that you can do. You can earmark some money. You can put it aside. Now, that is good from the point of view that the money is there. You've looked at the cost of funerals. You've perhaps earmarked enough money to cover the cost of the funeral. But you've also got to be aware that your death might not happen for some time and hopefully won't happen for a very long time. And that money will erode because of inflation. And your family may be left with less money to foot the bill than is required at the time of the funeral. So that considered, that is one way. And about 44% of funerals are paid for through cash and savings. So a large proportion of people still pay for funeral arrangements by those means. But the larger proportion of funeral costs are met by payouts from policies. Now, when I say policies, there are a number of different options and we can describe some of the options that are available to people in terms of insurance, but also in terms of prepayment, which may be a better option to saving your money once we uncover some of the advantages of that. Great. So let's split these almost into categories then. Should we start with insurance first? What insurance policies are there and how do they work? So life insurance is the policy that you want to look at, but life insurance comes in many forms. And I know that many people find that a confusing area to get their heads around. If you're at a stage of life and you've got a mortgage and you've got a young family, you probably need life insurance to take care of those things as well as your funeral arrangements. So the likelihood is that you need quite a lot of life insurance and you can earmark some of that life insurance for your funeral arrangements. So for example, if your mortgage is £200,000 and perhaps you want to leave another £200,000 for your partner to keep raising your children, you may then add another five to £10,000 to that amount in order to cover your funeral. And when the life insurance company pays out, that money can be used to pay for your funeral. Some life insurance companies actually include a funeral benefit. 
So where you have a term life insurance policy, and that's a life insurance policy that has a specific number of years to run for it, the funeral benefit means that even if your life insurance company is still processing the claim, they will make up to £10,000 available to you immediately so that you can take care of the things that need to be done immediately. And that takes a lot of the stress out of the situation for the bereaved family. Okay, so that's term life assurance. What else have we got? So another type of life insurance that's quite popular, and actually Sun Life is one of the companies that provide that type of cover, and they popularised it through the Parkinson ads, is over 50s life insurance. Now, there are a number of providers that provide over 50s life insurance plans. Many of them have different benefits, and you can get up to around about £20,000 cover. The key attraction to over 50s life insurance policies is that they don't ask about your health. And for people over the age of 50 who may have some health problems, that can sometimes be an attraction to buying that type of plan because it has a set price for a set amount of cover. And when you die, it will pay out that amount of cover. And what it does is it gives that cash that's paid out from the policy to your family. Again, funeral benefit may be included within that sort of plan so that some of the the money can be made available immediately if the claims process is going to take a little bit longer. But essentially, an over 50s life insurance is one that you can take out if you're between the ages of 50 and 80 years old, despite your health, and it will just cover you until you die whenever that happens. But it won't cover you if you're under the age of 50 because you won't qualify. And there is an additional caveat with some of these policies where there's a certain period in which you need to have paid premiums before it will pay the full benefit. Is that right? That's right. So qualifying periods apply to over 50s life insurance policies. So essentially, when you take out a plan, unlike a term life insurance, which starts covering you immediately when you start the plan, these plans, because they're not assessed on your health and because they don't ask you medical questions, include a slight caveat and won't pay out for the first two years of the policy. Some companies, it's a year, some companies it's two years, and some companies it may even be three years before you fully qualify for a full payout. That doesn't mean to say that the premiums will be lost. Many insurance companies will return the premiums to the family if the person dies within that period, but it is something to be aware of that that security isn't there for you immediately. And so we've looked at term life insurance, we've looked at over 50s life insurance. There's one more, isn't there? So there's also guaranteed whole of life insurance. Now, guaranteed whole of life insurance is for those people who are fortunate to still have their health beyond the age of 50. And actually, you can arrange guaranteed whole of life insurance policies at any point in your life. And what they do is they cover you and will pay out upon your death whenever that happens. So they don't have an end date. So unlike a term life insurance policy, you're not looking at this policy running out. It's eventually going to pay out. And it can be useful for people who perhaps don't have health problems. It can be sometimes cheaper or give you more cover for your money than an over 50s life insurance policy. So I generally would steer anyone who's looking at an over 50s life insurance policy to speak to a life insurance expert. And we can put the details of experts in the notes for our listeners to discuss these options because guaranteed whole of life insurance policies can give you more value for money than an over 50s life insurance policy and are often overlooked basically because they ask for your health details. But if there's nothing to worry about, then you should explore that avenue as well. Okay, so that's a whistle-stop tour of the insurance plans that are available to cover funerals. But you can actually pay for your funeral up front, can't you? You can. So prepaid funeral plans are often confused with the types of life insurance that we've just described. But prepaid funeral plans are exactly what they say on the tin. that are a way of prepaying your funeral costs. So there are a number of plans that are available in the market. You can purchase a plan outright. So depending on what part of the country you live in, you will be quoted a price for the funeral that you want. And that will depend on whether you want a cremation, a burial, the type of coffin you want, um, whether you want to include things like flowers, mourners, services, things like that. So the cost will be built in, you'll be given a price and you can pay that up front as one lump sum. Now, the great advantage of some of these plans is that they are future proofed. So where earlier in our conversation, Andy, we spoke about putting money aside and that can be something that's very useful to do. We also discussed the fact that 
that money may not be enough in 20, 30 years time to pay for a funeral because of the increasing costs of funerals. What's advantageous about these prepaid funeral plans is that there are assurances built in to the plans themselves to cover the cost of the funeral that you've laid out within the plan, whatever that cost may be at the time of your death. So that can give you some peace of mind that there won't be extra costs that your family will have to meet in the event of your funeral having to be arranged. So the future proofing element may seem quite attractive to some people, but we've talked about the average cost of funerals, several thousands of pounds. People may not have that sitting around. Are there other options for people who don't have the money that would still like to have this as an option for them? There are, and funeral plans can be arranged in instalments. So if you're quoted, say, for example, £4,000, you may be able to pay that £4,000 over a period of 12 months or 24 months in some plan cases. And you can also be offered the option of paying that amount over a longer period of time. But for most of the funeral plans that we looked at, if you choose to pay in instalments that are longer than two years, then you generally have to pay interest and that can inflate the cost of your funeral arrangement. So it's probably not the best option, but the option exists. So people should understand that you can spread the cost of that funeral arrangement. It could be between two and 25 years, but the optimum amount of years that you would spread the cost over without inflating the cost is between 12 months and 24 months. Okay, so just to finish off then, Harvey, we've covered the fact that the cost of funerals are on the rise, but there are options out there for people to take out insurances, save up for the plans. We've also covered briefly the direct cremation and direct burial services. So if I'm that person that would like to go down that route, is there anything else I need to consider? Essentially, it can seem very simple in the face of it. And for a lot of people, Andy, that's going to be an attractive proposition because it takes the frills away and it takes some of the, the work away for your family and essentially the cost away for your family. But the reality is, and this is quite hard for people to fathom, is that you won't be around when this is happening. And regardless of what you've chosen for your own funeral, your family might think otherwise. So what you should do is start the whole process with a conversation, a conversation with those people who will be interested to carry out the arrangements and will be the bereaved people that you leave behind because some of their sentiments will matter. And actually what the report revealed was that although some people choose a direct cremation or a direct burial option, which strips away a lot of the cost, some of the family members will then build back some of the frills and inflate the costs up because they're not happy not having flowers for you or they're not happy choosing the cheapest coffin or they're not happy not having a horse or limousines to take the family to the crematorium. So these are all things that you should discuss with your family and ensure that they would be happy as well because as much as you may be worried about the cost for them when you die they'll also want to give you the best end off. It's a really good point because I imagine a lot of parents don't want to burden their children. They don't want the fuss. And so it's simple and easy to think, I'll just go for the cheapest, simplest option. But of course, we all have family. We all want the best for our family. And that isn't always going to be the case. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much, Harvey. So Damien, moving on to the final piece of the podcast, then we're going to be talking about the fire movement. Well, not quite the fire movement. So if you remember, we've talked about it on the podcast before, financial independence, retirement, early it's got got quite a lot of fans but it also has its skeptics but there's a different type or a sibling to the fire movement and you're going to explain what it is yeah so just to give a recap to people who are not fully aware of what the fire movement is now this is a way of trying to become financially independent so you have the choice of whether you want to work going forward and that's hence why you've got the retire early part so you have this ability and the way you do that you you'll see different ways it's described but really there's four pillars to it so it will be you try and earn more you spend less so that's the frugality part of it and then you invest the difference wisely and then you need to know when enough is enough so that's kind of the four pillars so you will have seen people probably in articles and newspapers a very popular thing to write about and you may have seen blogs for example and you will see different types of people who have done it and different lifestyles and one of the 
criticisms that are often expressed about the fire movement is that it seems that people are almost in denying themselves and so they leave living incredibly frugal lives to be able to save away as much money as they can so therefore they don't have to go to work or have the choice where they want to go to work i mean of course working is optional and generally speaking they're trying to aim for a lump sum that is 25 times what the annual income they want to generate so it's really living by that four percent rule you'd be able to withdraw four percent a year and be able to live on that and your money hopefully not run out over the long term and that's meant to be a sustainable rate we've done podcasts which we'll link to that discusses the withdrawal rates and the debate around the four percent rule i mean there's an argument it should be lower if you want it to sustain going forward and particularly if you want it, your income to grow with and in excess of inflation perhaps so The fire movement has a lot of fans and there are people who have successfully retired early using it. But for a lot of people who may be looking at it, they might start down the journey of the fire movement and then find that it's quite onerous and they find themselves feeling almost deprived because having to put as much money away, they're not able to do the things that they want to do. And so one of the things about the fire movement that does come to mind is that it isn't particularly flexible i mean some people who do follow it are able to overcome life's curveballs things that go wrong they mean that you can't put away as much money as you want to and you're having to use money i don't know maybe something that happens financially that you need to take the money you've saved to be able to put it towards something so an alternative to the fire movement there's been different versions of it and there's one that i've seen called the fat fire and that's where you aim for a really luxurious retirement and there's one that's called the lean fire movement which is where you're going for a minimalist approach and i think the issue is that most people think that the lean fire as it's described is actually the standard version because they're the people that you sometimes see in articles but there's another version i just want to quickly touch upon that i quite like the sound of and it's something that's probably more in line with what i aim to be doing or trying to do with my own money and it's called coast fire And the idea behind Coast Fire is that what you do is instead of trying to retire early, it's less intense than the traditional fire movement because it allows people to stop saving once they reach a certain point. And that point isn't necessarily the point they're going to retire. And what they do is they will save aggressively early. It's particularly useful for people who may be in their 20s and 30s. And then they use the power of compounding to grow the pot of money that they've managed to save up to achieve a sum that is going to allow them to retire when they want. So let's give a a hypothetical example. Let's say somebody was hoping to retire by the time they were 35 or 40, and they're having to aggressively save up now to get a pot of money that might be, say, a couple of million by the time they reach that age, so they can have the choice to therefore not work, and they can withdraw money at maybe 4% a year. That means they'll be able to have the income that they want throughout the rest of their life. Then the coast version of that is that what people do and it's particularly relevant for the people who maybe are in their 20s and 30s is that they will save up an amount of money aggressively to the point that they say maybe hit 35 and that sum of money they will therefore invest and allow the power of compounding for that to grow and they may decide to therefore delay their retirement to say 55 so what they will do is they will choose to continue to work but they may decide to do a job that's less pressured, less stressful, because they've built up a pot earlier. They've allowed the ability of compounding for that to grow. And it's say, if you pick a, a, a number out of the air, say 7% a year and compounds, that by the time they get to 55, they've got a big pot there. Therefore, they can retire. And 55 is obviously, generally speaking, quite early to retire for most people. So the idea of coasting comes from that you do the hard work. It's almost like going up a hill for a limited period of time. You therefore no longer save because you build up this pot that's much smaller than the pot that you would have done under the traditional fire route then you allow that to compound by investing over time you then coast downhill into your retirement and you do a job that you probably prefer because you haven't got to keep saving for an extended period of time or very aggressively so that's the idea of the coast movement and it is something that is probably more reflective of what i do in my finances now I would like to get to a point where I have enough money in my pension at a point soon where I would hopefully be able to allow that to be investing and compounding over time, that lump sum, so that by the time I get to maybe the age that I'd like to retire, I'd have more than enough in that pension pot. So rather than looking at the Everest hill that I've got to 
get to, I'm sitting there thinking, if I look at the smaller amount, I have to do it more aggressively for a shorter period of time and then allow that to compound. Now, like I said, this is particularly relevant to people who are in their 20s and 30s. So if you are in that age group, then it is something I think that's worth looking at because the numbers that you'll be having to save are going to be much smaller. Of course, people in that age group, you've got to realise, also want to buy a house. So they're going to have to be considering that at the same time, building up deposits. But the benefits of the Coast Method is it's more relaxed next version of the more traditional fire movement and it supposedly allows people to enjoy their social lives a little bit more you can have a little bit more of a diverse lifestyle i mean i'd love to hear from anybody who's done it or who's doing it who's achieved it and then there's probably people who are trying to do it but anyone who's used the coast method and actually achieved financial independence so to sum up it's probably a more balanced approach to reaching financial independence going forward and it's probably going to be another version of the fire movement where people don't actually ever retire so they actually carry on working or plan to work doing something for a much longer period of time which is probably where we're going to end up with retirement anyway the idea that people just stop but if you are listening to this and you're thinking i like the sound of this so how much do i need now i can't give you a figure off the top of my head for everybody but what we will do is put a link in the notes of this show to a calculator that we've built where you can put in the amount of money you have now you can put in any regular amount you want to put in and then what it will do is you can compound that up to see what you will have at, by a certain point in the in the future so you can play around with that calculator to sit there and see right okay let's say you're 25 you might decide well how much do i need to have at 35 so i can stop saving so that i could retire early at 55 what you need to do is work out what the amount of money that you will want to have at 55 if you're using the fire method times that by 25 to give you the big lump sum and then you've got to reverse engineer that so you work out well 35 to 55 that's 20 years what sum of money do i need to have to compound so it will compound at a growth rate which you can set let's say you pick seven percent to get to that large sum call it one and a half million by age 55 and therefore you know right if you're 25 i've got 10 years to try and get to that sum and it's a different way of doing it but i think it will be more appealing to some people and even if you aren't in your 20s or 30s don't forget that the pension limits have gone up so people are now able to pump their pensions that little bit more. So you could put up to £60,000, depending on your earnings, you get tax relief into a pension each year. And so at the moment, that means across two years, either side of a tax year, you could actually put £120,000 into a pension pot if you're fortunate enough to have that money. And there will be people out there who can, but it does mean, therefore, that you could start to do that even if you're in your 40s, see if you could try and pump your pension quickly. And it's particularly relevant for people who do own businesses who may be able to do something like that and dictate their pension contributions, be able to pump it sooner and then allow it to compound over time and be able to choose the time at which they retire. So pensions do remain one of the most tax efficient ways for you to be able to build up that pension pot. £60,000 a year is pretty generous. Theoretically, though, you could put as much as you like and you just won't get that tax relief. Yeah, and obviously it depends on your earnings as well. Yeah, so that is it. We are done for this week. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do so in the usual way. It's damien at moneytothemasses.com or you can contact me, Andy, at moneytothemasses.com. Please do review the podcast if you like it. Please do give us five stars as well. And if you give us a particularly going review and then email us to claim that review, you may win yourself a coveted Money to the Masses mug. And don't forget, do follow us on YouTube as well. Subscribe to the channel. And don't forget, you can write comments below the video of this podcast if you want it's a good way of engaging with us and last week i went through and answered a bunch of your comments and questions as well so do do that for us on all the social channels goes without saying and don't forget the quiz that's going to be on our instagram story on monday morning so that's it we're done for this week until next time until next time oh.